why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Katie anything. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. Um, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, my name is Katie Morton. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I have been talking about mental health online for over eight years. Wow. Time flies when you're having a good time. Um, but the way that this works, if you're new, is I ask questions on the YouTube channel, Opinions That Don't Matter. That is a channel that my husband and I have uh, for our podcast because our podcast together is called Opinions That Don't Matter. Um, anyway, I ask the questions or ask for the questions that will be read in this podcast on the community tab over there. And I usually ask them, like uh, Sean helped me, he scheduled the asks. So they will go out at 9 a.m. on Mondays. This is Pacific Standard Time. So now you know, we've scheduled them, get ready. Um, Cause that'll be easier than, cause a lot of you are like, what time? And I don't really know, it's like, when I remember. So <laughs> hopefully that will give you a better idea of when to ask them. But today I have 11 questions. Um, yeah, so let's just get into them. I hope you're doing well, by the way. Um, I know things are still weird. Shit's weird, you guys, but we're doing our best. Um, so I hope that you're taking care of yourself. I hope that you're taking time off. Like yesterday, for instance. So I record this on a Tuesday in the uh, in the late afternoon, like early evening. And it goes up on a Thursday. But on Monday of this week, I was so exhausted. I just didn't sleep the night before like much. I, no, no, I just didn't sleep well at all. And I think it's because, do you ever know you have to get up early? Because I had an 8 a.m. dentist appointment. Because I was like, I want to be the first one in, the first one out of there. Um when I know I have to get up early, it's like, I'm so worried that I'm going to oversleep. I don't know. I just don't sleep as well. And so all day Monday, I was just like, oh, I can barely hold it together. And so I took a nap in the middle of the day because self-care and necessary. And then I went to bed at like 830. <laughs> I was pooped. Um, but today's a new day and I feel, I feel good. Back to pretty much normal. Okay. Without further ado and chitty chatness, let's get into this first question. The first question says, how is a therapist generally trained to respond when they notice their client getting teary in session? Good question. I've never been super teary until about three weeks ago and was surprised when my therapist responded softly with, it's okay, don't cry, don't cry. Hey, don't cry. It's okay, don't cry. So I pushed the emotion down, finished the Zoom call, super confused, as you should be. My only justification was that we were near the end of the session, but she hasn't brought it up since. Why would I bother to let an emotion surface again? Okay, uh, your therapist sucks terribly. I mean, maybe that's, she thought that that would be like soothing, like, oh, shh, like you would a baby. Like, you know, if like a toddler's like throwing a tantrum or something, like, oh, don't cry. It's okay. It's okay. Don't cry. You try to like soothe them. But in therapy, we're actually told to just, or not told, but like taught to just empathize with our patients, meaning you, you want them to know it's okay. So you try to make eye contact with them. If they're willing to make eye contact with you, you look right at them, you say, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, and you, I don't really talk that much. I kind of just let them feel it, let them work their way through it. And I might say like, I hear you know that you're okay. This is okay. You know, if everything you're feeling is warranted. I might go through things like that. Never, ever, ever, never would I say, don't cry. <laughs> I mean, what? That's so not uh, validating. That's not supportive. That in the fact that then you stuffed it down because I mean, what were you supposed to do? And then she's not bringing it up again. I don't know. Your therapist kind of sucks. I, I, I would definitely bring it up because I do not like the idea that any of us would just stop seeing a therapist unless there's something like egregious, like a terrible thing, um, which we have a question later on that has one of those in it where you're like, what the actual fuck? But when it comes to this situation, a therapist telling you like, don't cry, don't cry. I would bring that up in session. You're going to have to make yourself a note and you're going to have to practice probably. And you probably hate me for even saying this, but you're going to have to communicate about it. So I'd bring it up in session and say, Hey, you know, uh, two sessions ago or four sessions ago or whatever it happens to be by that time. Um, you know, I, I teared up towards the end of session and your response was to tell me to, to not cry, to say, don't cry, don't cry. It's okay. Don't cry. And I found that really invalidating. 
because it's hard enough for me already to get teary as you know, as you've noticed. Um, and then just let that sit. You can ask if you want to ask a question, be a little bit more direct and be like, um, you know, ask them to not do that. You could say like, Hey, next time, if I do get teary, could you just, um, tell me it's okay. Because I've always felt like it wasn't okay to cry. And you saying, don't cry just made me feel, you know, you could really get into it. I would encourage you to get into it as much as you can. Um, but we have to communicate that we have to understand maybe because this happens to a lot of people, especially therapists, we're overwhelmed right now. We're stressed out too. I'm just gonna, you know, try to take into consideration all sides. Maybe she didn't realize what she was saying. Maybe she's overwhelmed. And so she's like, oh, don't cry, don't cry. And didn't think about it. But we need to bring that to her attention because we don't want it to happen again. Because again, it's really hurtful. It's really invalidating. And in my training, we were really trained to just mirror a patient. If you notice, um, I think I've talked about this in the past. I'm trying to remember which pod, I don't know which number it is. But anyway, mirroring is when I like mimic your behavior. So like if you're sitting with your arms across your chest, I might, you know, sit with my arms across my chest. If you lean towards me, I'm going to lean towards you. Um, if you like, you know, are, are just like hugging your stomach, I might hug my stomach. I'll do a lot of the behaviors that you do. Because what we know is that it makes people feel more comfortable, makes them feel like I get them, you know, like the therapist understands and is right where they are. It's a strange psychological phenomenon, but it's something that we do. So we can do mirroring. Um, you know, you can even, I, I try to even use my patient's words. Like I don't take what they tell me. Like if I have them explain an experience to me, let's say you were talking to me about this and you're like, hey, Katie, you know, and you said that it was really invalidating, really hurtful. And it made it difficult for me to, um, to want to, to be emotional later or to bring it up and cry in session again. When I am talking to you about that, I'm going to use your same terms like it was invalidating and I won't use my own. I won't be like, it didn't make you feel hurt or understood. I would say, you know, it was invalidating. It made it hard to open up later. I would use exactly the same terms that you used. And so that's kind of a, another part of that. Um, and that was really, that was what I was taught. And also I feel like any normal human, not even just therapists, but any normal human that someone's coming to them with a problem and they don't normally cry and they cry. Like even if I had a friend come up to me that didn't normally cry and they cried, I would never say like, don't cry, don't cry. I'd be like, oh my God, what's wrong? I'm here. I can listen. You know, I mean, I feel like that's the role of the therapist is like, I'm here. I can listen. I'll hold space for you. I'll make it, you know, we'll work on this together, but this is okay. Um, so yeah, bring it up with your therapist. Um, but may, they kind of suck also, <laughs> but you need to talk to them about it. No canceling, no ignoring it. We're going to have to talk about it. I know it makes you uncomfortable, but we all have to challenge that because it's too easy to get back into that comfort zone which has gotten us to a place that we don't like, which is why we're in therapy to talk about it, right? So talk about it, bring it up, but that's not right. And that's not normal. And it's not very good therapist uh, behavior. Okay, question number two. It says, hi, Katie. I really struggle with feeling responsible for other people's emotions, including my therapist. Uh-oh, uh oh, I constantly analyze people to ensure I know how they are feeling so I can respond appropriately. Where does that leave you? Leaves you with no space to be you. This is an exhausting habit of mine and causes me to not be able to meet my own needs. Exactly. It is especially unhealthy in therapy because I am so concerned with how my therapist is doing and how I make her feel. She has very healthy boundaries with me and has not played into this issue at all. I believe it really is a me problem. I think it causes me to hold back in session because I don't want to make her sad. For context, I'm definitely an empath, could have guessed that, um, at, or empath type, and was a parentified child of a single mom. That explains a lot. Do you have any advice? Thanks for your help. Love from Canada. Yay, Canada. Love Canada. Um, okay. Uh, this, uh, okay. I have even struggled with this personally. It means also that we're not very good at boundaries and doesn't leave any space for us to take care of ourselves because everybody else comes first. This is tricky, but noticing it is the first step. And I know that, that you're like, well, duh, but that's hard for a lot of us because we'll do it. You'd probably be surprised how often you do it, even with strangers. Like I used to talk about, um, or I've talked about over the years and maybe in, even in my book, I don't remember, 
is like when I would go into grocery stores or other public places, I would feel, I would like apologize. I over apologize. That would be how mine would present itself mostly. But I would even apologize for like being in the way of someone at the grocery store. Like, oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Like as if I don't have the same right to look at the rice, just like they're looking at the rice. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. And so my therapist, uh, first thing was just to have me like notice when it's happening. So I want you to pay attention to all of the times which is might be like 99.9% of your day, <laughs> all the time you're assessing other people's behaviors or movements or eye, you know, eye contact or non-eye contact, facial expressions, and assuming you know how they feel. Because we have to notice when we're doing it in order to fix it. But also the the like quote unquote mind reading or empathic uh, I don't know what I want to call it. It's not like a superpower, but those skills are not 100% effective. Um, we can often read into situations. This drives my husband crazy. I will tell Sean, I'll be like, how come you're so upset? And he's like, I'm not upset. And I'm like, you're acting so strange. He's like, I'm not. And I'm like, yeah, something's wrong. He's like, will you stop? I'd tell you if something was wrong. But that's because we read into things and make up whole stories that don't even exist. So, okay, notice when you're doing it. Check your facts. That's the second thing, right? Because that, what you think these thoughts and these interpretations are not facts. Facts would be something like, let's say in the example of Sean being upset or something, if he said, oh, this is so frustrating. I'm just in such a bad mood today. That would be a fact. If he said, oh, I just don't want to talk about it, Katie. Let's stop. I'm frustrated. Or anything with any kind of verbal confirmation of said what I assume are quote unquote facts. Now, obviously there are some overt behaviors or things that you can do to show your frustration, like even just the, uh, mm, uh, or something like that, which I know are not like actual words and sentences and verbal confirmations, but they are like behavioral slash verbal confirmations in their own right. So pay attention to those and check your facts. And then before you assume about other people, you're going to need to ask them for verification. So we're going to go a step further in checking those facts. Now, okay, in therapy, now let's get into it in therapy because this is really where it's like festering and, and bothering you the most is talk to her about it. You have to bring it up. You have to let her know because this is something that you really, trust me when I tell you that it's still difficult for me, but it's very doable. And I engage in this less and less and less. Although I have to be honest during COVID because I I think we're all kind of stressed out at the beginning. I found myself dipping back into it, but then I was able to like write the, the plane and pull it out, you know, of the downward spiral. So when we are stressed, we might still want to do this, but Talk about it in therapy because I think that'll be the main thing that you need to work on. And I would believe my hypothesis is that being a parentified child maybe means that you're, I don't know. I don't know if you, there's a couple of ways this could play out. Number one, you had a parent that was really explosive, meaning uh, maybe they would, you know, scream out, or you didn't know what, you didn't know what parent you were going to get. Sometimes they're loving and caring, other times they're not. And so you would walk on eggshells and try to read their every move and every gesture so that you could be just perfect so that you wouldn't quote, cause, even though you didn't cause it, but that's what we believe, that you would cause them to explode. And so we do all this shit trying to, uh, and then we take responsibility like, oh, if they did blow up, I didn't do everything right. I wasn't perfect enough. I didn't uh, make dinner just right or do this, that, or the other thing, even though you're not responsible for other people, they're responsible for themselves and their own reactions. But so there's that, or there's the other part that like um, addiction comes into play, which doesn't necessarily mean a parent is violent or anything, um, but they're unpredictable. And we can believe especially as children, that our action or inaction can cause them to use the substance, maybe drinking, maybe drugs, whatever it is. And then we can feel responsible for that when we're not. And so there's a lot to unpack there. And that's why it's really important to bring it up in th session in therapy, because we have to figure out where it's coming from for you. And you can use your empathic badassness to your advantage. But we don't want it to bleed into other parts of our life where we feel responsible because being able to read a room and being what I would call a highly sensitive person, which I have a video about that on my main channel, I would check that out. Um, it has its benefits in situations because we are able to read uh, people and rooms and we can act accordingly that can help us out in business and in friendships and things like that. But that's really it. And we need to like put a cap on it because if we do too much of this, like, 
reading into other people in our lives and every little movement of their face and everything they do or like I mean, I used to spend days thinking I'd offended someone because they just like sent a short text back. They're like, okay. And I'm like, oh my God, I offended them. I, why didn't they send any heart emojis? Like this is the shit that used to keep me up at night, you guys. That, that's what this can do. And so that's why it's important to recognize when we're being a caring, loving human in our world and when we're taking ownership and responsibility for other people. So I know I could talk about this. Maybe this is something that it's like an, an entire video. I'll have to make a note because I always forget that. I say that and then I'm going to put in caps, make entire video because I get, um, when I'm done with this, I like completely forget that I said that. So yeah, I made a note. Don't worry. Um, because I do think this is something that we should talk about is like feeling responsible for other people. And then what you're going to work on in therapy is boundaries. And it's hard and it's uncomfortable. And it's something that, you know, I have a video coming out soon about that. So stay tuned. But they're so necessary because their response is not on you. How we can't control other people. And the sooner we realize that, the, the I can't tell you how freeing it is. I have to be honest. As someone who stayed up worrying, oh my God, they hurt their feelings. Oh, 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 it's exhausting. The sooner I could recognize that and be like, you know what? They get to feel however they want to feel. And I get to feel however I want to feel. And how I want to feel is not stressed out. Um, anyway, we'll move on. But you can use it to your advantage. It helps in situations, social situations where you don't maybe know people as well, but that's about it. And then we kind of need to like, you know, manage it, recognize our urge to do it and instead check our facts. That's when you ask questions first. We don't assume it's all that stuff. Um, but anyway, that's going to be a whole video. So stay tuned for that. Cause I think there's so much to talk about. Okay. Question number three it says, Hi, Katie. I have this problem that no one seems to understand. It has to do with time and my feeling that I wasted my whole life so far. I hear this all the time. I'm 31 now. I'm in a panic to also lose my 30s like I did my youth and my 20s to the point that I set deadlines for myself. People tell me that I'm still young and you can still do a lot of things when you're 40 and 50. And I agree with that, but they disagree. I strongly disagree. It doesn't help at all. I understand. It's not helping you now, but you can still do things. Um, I want to make memories while I'm still young. The problem is that all the things I want to experience the most are based on being with other people and I have a very hard time finding them because uh, of social anxiety and other circumstances. Do you have a tip on how I can reduce the pressure a bit? Thank you. Now, this was a great question. I got a lot of likes, a lot of comments, a lot of people agreeing that they feel that way too. And the truth is, and you're not going to like this answer, but this, okay, this is tough love therapist coming out your worry that you're not making the most of your life is what's causing you to not make the most of your life. So in essence, you're sabotaging yourself by even having this conversation. And I know that that sounds shitty and that's not helpful, but we have to start there because you're doing it. You're like shitting all over yourself. You're shitting so much that you can't enjoy anything. Um, and there, I don't know exactly where this is coming from for you. So I'm going to hit it from a, a couple of different points. And my first question is, what are your expectations for your life and making these memories? Are we comparing it to other people? Because my thoughts are you probably are and everybody's different. Um, like for instance, I did not go to a large university, mainly because I wanted the small university feel. But then there's a ton of things that my friends who went to like UW and Seattle and USC and UCLA and like these big colleges, they had these experiences of going to games and doing these certain things. And Pepperdine had games and all were division one, but we did not have a football team. There were no big rally. It, we, it was just not a big school. For a while, I used to feel like, God, I wish I would have done that. I don't, I'm not having the same experience and oh, 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 bullshit. Who cares? I'm having my own experience. I need to focus on my own self and stuff that I want to accomplish, things that I enjoy, what I'm doing. Because if I'm my whole life looking out at someone else, a Joe Schmo over there thinking, man, they have it so much better. I'm not having that experience. I'm never going to be happy with my experience. You, you, you hear me? You feel me, people? Because we do that a lot. We look at other people and like, oh, fuck, I should have done this. Oh, I'm such a whoa, 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 spiral into pit of despair. And that's not helpful. So notice if you're doing that. And if you are, I would encourage you to pull your brain out of it. Stop. Stop doing the comparison. Just imagine me in your head saying, stop, stop, stop. That's not helpful. Instead, let's focus on what we want to do or what we've done. We have to change those thoughts. Don't allow it over there. Bring it back. So that's part of it. Then the second part is, 
Um, are we, so not only comparing, but are we setting ourselves up for failure on purpose? Maybe we are. You'd be surprised how many people do this because they're so afraid of failing on their own. There's this great quote. If you guys don't know, I love the show, The Office, um, but they're, uh, it's Andy Bernard, and I forget which episode it is, but they're interviewing him. You know, he's sitting in the conference room when they do their little interviews. And he's like, Andy Bernard doesn't lose anything. Andy Bernard either quits or um, or, or that wasn't fair, says it wasn't fair or something. And oftentimes we pull out of situations. We don't challenge ourselves because we're so afraid of, of failing or it not working out the way that we've dreamed a dream. And so we have to pay attention to whether we're consciously making choices that, that put us in the position that we're in, or if there are extenuating circumstances that we need to take into consideration. So I just want to, I know I'm kind of, it sounds like I'm all over the place, but I'm just telling you all the ways that this the reasons this can exist, because you said social anxiety and other circumstances. So it sounds like we have a reason for not meeting our quote unquote goals or making the most out of our time and our life. Um, but again, I'm curious because are you taking into consideration your social anxiety and other circumstances? Is Are we, are we managing our expectations and our goals because because we should be factoring that in. That's not really fair to not factor it in. It's like, it'd be, um, I don't know, it'd be like me wishing that I, uh, I'm just going to use anxiety because that's an easy one to pull from. But like, that's like me being mad that I don't have any friends and haven't gone on any road trips, let's say, because I've seen people do road trips. So I'm comparing and I think it sounds really cool and it's something I want to do. And I want to do it before I'm 30. Well, fuck, I'm 30 or 31. Shit. Um, I didn't consider my social anxiety and the fact that I need to work on that. I need to, so your goals, like my goals might not be a road trip right now with a group of friends I don't have. Cause that's not an achievable goal. I might need to check my goals and instead be like, maybe the goal is that I meet and make one new friend this year. I mean, with COVID things are all kinds of crazy and fucked up, but that doesn't mean that we can't make one friend. And that will be the goal because we're moving towards that ultimate goal of going on a road trip with a, maybe one close friend instead of a group of friends. Okay. It, we have to make the goals achievable for us, not just things that we think could necessarily happen. I'm not saying you know, you can't achieve your goals. That's not the message that I want you to hear. We can all achieve our goals, but we have to make them responsible and achievable for us to keep us motivated for the bigger goal that maybe like in five years, we have a group of friends and we all go on a road trip. Do you see what I mean? Like setting expectations, setting goals that work with all the information that we already know about ourselves, which is pretty much everything, right? Because we know our, nobody knows us best, better than ourselves. But if you have social anxiety, we have to take that into consideration. What does that mean for you? And then let's set some goals about that first. If all of the other things that you're wanting to experience are based on being with other people, then we got to tackle that fucking social anxiety because it is holding you back from all your goals. And so I think in a way, my, sorry, I'm all over, but this, I'm going to stop apologizing for that because I'm just, that's just, you're here for it. That's what I do. Get on board or don't listen, whatever. Um, so we have to, it sounds like you're setting goals without taking into consideration your situation and therefore you're always not meeting them and you're always disappointing yourself. And so then you're always feeling like shit. So instead, I want you to focus on the things that are getting in your way. It's like we have these roadblocks and we need to, to take them apart and get them out of our way or take another route. What can we do to do that? Are we seeing a therapist? Are we challenging our social anxiety through exposure? And calming our system down? Are we doing those things? We should probably be doing those things since it says the problem is all the things I want to experience the most are based on being with other people. So that's where it's at for this. And I know this is definitely like a tough love type of answer. But sometimes I think we just we do it to ourselves. It's like we're shooting ourselves in the foot. You're like, oh, I feel like I've wasted my whole life. Everybody's felt that way, first of all. And yes, there's plenty of time to do everything. But you're 31. Let's, let's stop doing this. Let's stop this pattern. That's not getting us where we're going. It's like, what's that old definition of, um, uh, I don't know if it's like crazy or whatever, but it's like doing the same thing, expecting a different result. That's the definition of, of crazy. I, I'm, it's the wrong word. It's not crazy, but I can't think of it right now. Cause I've, I've been writing the book all day and my brain's a little fried. Um, but 
we can't keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. That doesn't make any sense. And so I would encourage you to try something different. Come up with some new tools. Uh, maybe if it's online therapy, you look into things like BetterHelp and Talkspace. Um, maybe communicate with people in our community. We have the Katie group on Facebook. There's other ways you can you know, engage with other people who are trying to better themselves. Um, I have a ton of videos about like sabotaging and how to stop and um, negative self-talk, which is probably kind of part of this as well, and social anxiety and tools and exposure therapy. There's so many videos I've done over the years. So checking those out and then resetting your goals. I want you to throw all your other goals out the window because that will reduce the pressure. We need to have goals that are achievable for us, not for everybody else. Those things can be long-term. Like I would like to do that some, at some point. I want to do that sometime. I don't know when, but some point in time. So I'm working backwards from that. And here's what I want to do in the next week, next month, next six months, next year. And we have to build from that. And so like my goal for you would be to connect with somebody who lives in your area, be it on a group, like if there's groups online, or if you can safely, uh, if you have a friend that you kind of know, but you don't know well, maybe you could text them or connect with them through Zoom or something. You know, those are all things that I would have you try to work towards. Um, but having a therapist to help you would be really, really beneficial. I hope that helps. I know it's a little strong armed, a little, uh, a little tough love, but I think that the sabotage is self sabotage. And you know, we have to take into consideration what we're dealing with. And if we have social anxiety, meeting people and um, having a bunch of friends and people in our lives, that, that's something we're going to have to work on in a different way than others. And so we have to consider that when we're setting those goals. So anyway, I hope that helps. I hope that, that was kind of clear. I know I'm always a little scattered, but it's because there's so many reasons that this could exist. Um, and anxiety also, just FYI, putting it out there for any of you who are like, oh, I don't really feel like I've wasted my life, but I definitely like feel like I'm not doing enough. Anxiety always comes along with that because if you don't know, anxiety is, you know, uncontrollable worry. So if we we're worried that we're wasting our whole life, we're worried that we're not doing this enough, we're worried that, you know, that's just part of anxiety. So don't let it win. See somebody and maybe medication could help too. But it sounds like it's more part of your anxiety than than an actual, you know, problem. Um, and then setting your goals, taking your social anxiety into consideration. Okay. Question number four. Is it normal to feel exhausted for weeks at a time? Things still mostly get done, but no matter how much time I put into getting adequate sleep, I still wake up exhausted. Any tips for being productive while working through exhaustion? First things first, you should get checked out by a doctor. <laughs> and I say that because um, Sean was tired for I don't know, quite a little while, let's say like six months. And it wasn't like crazily tired, but he had such a tough time getting up in the morning and um, just wasn't as energetic, wouldn't want to do things. Like we we used to be super, super active and we'd always be out, outdoors and doing something. He'd be like, oh, I don't really feel like it. Uh. Turned out his vitamin D was like dangerously low. And so if we hadn't gone in to get our physicals and get blood work done, we wouldn't have found that out. And then he wouldn't have gotten his vitamin D back up. So getting checked out by a doctor, getting blood work done, just making sure everything's, you know, on the up and up because there's vitamin D just is just one example, but there's a lot of examples. Like some of my friends have told me that their like liver function or kidney function or, um, you know, their potassium levels are low or there's all sorts of things that can cause us to feel very tired. So get checked out from a doctor, get to get a regular physical and ask for a full blood panel. Okay. A full blood panel will ensure that they do like a more exhaustive list, not just the basics. Tell me you want it. You've been exhausted and you want to know what's going on. Um, but most of the things I mentioned will come like on any blood panel that they run. Then, then my next thing is potential um, depression. And the reason that I want to talk about depression is part of it is like fatigue and feeling like sleepy all the time. Now, that also comes along with, so here's some checking for you. It also comes along with anhedonia, um, or not anhedonia. Um, is that the right word? Yes, I think. But anyways, it's when we don't, sorry guys, like I told you, my brain is, um, is like mush today. So anhedonia is when we don't enjoy the things we used to enjoy. It's like the inability to feel 
to feel pleasure. Okay. And so when we have anhedonia, that is always part of depression. Um, so we have to check and see if that is the case. Do we enjoy the things we used to enjoy? Let's say we used to, uh, I don't know, love going for a bike ride. And now the idea of doing that just, mm. and yes, that could be part of our exhaustion, but are there other things that we used to enjoy that don't involve like exercise or, or movement or a lot of energy out that we still don't enjoy? Like maybe we used to enjoy playing a certain video game or watching a certain show. And now we're just like, bleh, everything just bleh, sounds bleh. notice because that might be depression. And then the final thing I want to discuss with this is COVID-19 is a real deal. Okay. I can't emphasize enough how it can affect our mental health and the fact that we're in this heightened fight, flight, freeze response or just stress response in general. Many of us feel traumatized, especially if we're any level of essential worker, meaning anywhere in our food chain, anywhere in the healthcare system from the people cleaning up to the people, you know, uh, packing up our food and delivering it. Like there's so many ways that we can be traumatized because it's scary to put yourself at risk, especially when we have to with our work and our job, right? And we, to, we should, in the same time, we feel thankful for having our job and then we're scared. It's all sorts of complicated. So I just want to put out there that being in that heightened sense of stress for a really, really long time, right? We're going up on month five. Is that right? March to April, May, June, July, August. Yeah. August will be month five. On the 16th of August, I will have been in quarantine for five months. Um, that stress is exhausting, feeling hyper vigilant for any of my uh, listeners out there who also like struggled with PTSD like prior to COVID, you know how fucking exhausting it is being hyper vigilant. Our bodies are constantly on the lookout. We can be jumpy. We can have flashbacks. We, it's just so exhausting. Um, and so that it could be part of that. And so I would, I would want you to try some of the techniques I offered in like my COVID videos, for instance, like shaking it out. Uh, the reason that it can be so exhausting is all that energy that our body has built up from fight, flight, freeze. It's like trapped inside and we can't get it out. And so it causes us to feel like just on edge, agitated, irritated, and then exhausted. And so shaking it out can get that energy out. Um, it can like Put, bring our nervous system kind of back down to baseline. Um, we can also, I mean, exercise helps like any kind of movement to shake it out. Uh, sucking and swallowing hard candies can help soothe our system. Um, giving ourselves some like loving touch or anything. Anyway, I have a ton of videos about those, like dealing with loneliness, dealing with the COVID anxiety. There's all sorts of stuff. So check those out. I think it will really help. But, you know, get checked out by a doctor first because it could just be a reason like vitamin D being low or something like that. Um, and it could be depression, but it also, we're all in a stress response. So I just want you to know that we could all be feeling a little exhausted. Like for instance, I was saying at the beginning how yesterday I legitimately took a two hour nap and then went to bed at 8.30. So, you know, that's not like me, but I think it's because I didn't sleep well the night before and I'd just been doing a lot. So I was pooped. Um, okay, I hope that helps. Question number five. This is where it starts to get interesting, you guys. You ready? Remember I said we had that question about that was like weird therapist stuff? Hi, Katie. A little question about moral, moral slash ethics. My mom slept with my therapist. They were friends before he became my therapist and I walked in on them having sex. He then became my therapist three years later when my grandma passed away. He would come to my house and do the therapy for free in the same room that I walked in on them having sex, by the way. It was really uncomfortable, especially since my mom was in the next room. After the therapy, he would come next door and we'd just sit and watch TV or something casual. He still has a sexual relationship with my mom to this day, but no longer works in the mental health field. He still comes to my house sometimes, but I try to avoid him. He buys me things, sometimes large purchases, like bought me a new bed, contributed towards my prom, etc. I cannot stand this man and feel resentful towards my mother, but feel guilty and like I'm overreacting because they're both consenting adults, and I feel like it's none of my business." Is this ethically normal since they knew each other before he became my therapist? I'm also scared if I get another therapist, they won't believe me or take me seriously. Thanks, Katie. Holy shit, there's so much to unpack here. First of all, this person should have never become your therapist. That's not right. That's wrong. That's where the ethics comes into play. Truthfully, he can sleep with whoever he wants. Um, not being your therapist doesn't matter, right? 
sleeping with your mom, that's totally fine. But then three years later, him becoming your therapist is wrong. He should not have accepted you as a patient, nor should he have come to your house and done the therapy for free. And I know a lot of you right now are saying, Katie, but he was doing a nice thing, offering therapy for free. That's a weird situation. And offering therapy for free is actually not beneficial for people. And just hear me out, okay? We find the reason that um, a lot of systems of care have a copay. Now, they don't have to pay a lot. I'm not saying that people have to pay what they can't afford in therapy. I'm just saying we have to have some skin in the game. We have to have some investment in the therapy in order for us to be invested. I know that sounds silly, but research proves that that is true, that we have to have some kind of something that we're putting out in order to, um, to be giving our effort to therapy. Also, the fact that he came to your house and offered it for free, and then your mom was in the next room, that's not very private. That's not okay. Even if we were okay with him giving it for free, which is fine, okay, we're getting therapy for free. That's awesome. You should be going to an office. There should be some you know, HIPAA compliance, at least in the States. I don't know if this is in the States, but either way, it's really fucked up. doesn't matter where it is. Um, but there's, there's confidentiality. There's all sorts of things that can't, you can't, say it's confidential and okay when you're it's just so messed up okay so if he was sleeping with your mom shouldn't have become your therapist that's that's not okay because that's a conflict of interest that's a dual relationship is what we call it in the therapy field and so you could file a complaint against this therapist um the dual relationship is the fact that he is your mom's boyfriend or a sexual partner i don't know if his boyfriend or whatever but then and your therapist that's not okay for instance like if i had a patient of mine that let's say went to my church i don't go to church but let's say they go to my church um i would have to have a conversation with them about this situation it some dual relationships can be managed like i could tell them hey you know i'll go to the earlier uh sunday uh, service is that okay you know or if you don't mind that I'm at the regular service I'll sit in the back or over here or if anybody you know I won't tell anybody I know you because you don't do that as a therapist by the way a patient out in the wild I always tell my patients this if you're out in the wild and I see you like at the grocery store or something I won't acknowledge you you have every right you can totally come up to me and say hi but I won't say hi to you because I don't want people around you like if your friend or family or whoever's with you I don't want them to say like how do you know that person and then you're on the hook to try to explain to them when that's just not right so that again is like confidentiality right so but if you want to come say hi to me I can say hi and that's fine that's totally cool um because that's you deciding because it's your you hold the confidence okay I hope that makes sense but then another dual relationship could be like I own um I own a uh I don't know a yoga studio and I am um, I practice, I mean, I teach there. And as your therapist, your therapist also comes to that yoga studio and practices there. Now in small towns, people make some concessions on this. But when I was taught in school that like in a city, like I live in LA and there's tons of options as a therapist, I should not go to my patient's yoga studio. That's a dual relationship. I shouldn't have these two things happening at the same time. It's just easier and more ethical for me to just go to the other one. Um, and I know for a lot of people, they'll be like, I don't understand. That's crazy. But I just, it's not, it's best for you to only see your therapist in session, in their office, in a private place, not out in public, not at church, not at your yoga studio, not, um, I don't know, not as part of the same like housing development or something, you know, it just gets really complicated and really tricky. And so this is just all sorts of wrong. Um, okay. So I want to make sure I'm answering your questions. You're not overreacting. They can have sex with whoever they want, but this person should never have become your therapist, should never have offered, should never have come to your home, should never have done any of that. Um, Cause now this person's like your mom's boyfriend it's very weird. Um, and because they knew each other before, he should not have become your therapist. That should have been like the, for like, nope. Um, and if you tell another therapist, they'll believe you and take you seriously. I've heard the worst and most crazy, horrific, terrible stories about therapists over the years. Some falling asleep on their patients, like seriously, not remembering their names. Um, a therapist sleeping with a patient, which is against the law. There's a book I have to give out when people tell me if I've never had anybody tell me that in their in my office, knock on wood. But if someone does tell me that their their past therapist, you know, slept with them or made passes at them, I have to give them this book that's like professional therapy does not include sex. Um, 
it's yeah, it's, there's so many things that are legally and ethically wrong with this. And so it's okay to not be able to stand him. Um, I would talk about this in, I would get a new therapist on your own, go to an actual office, um, pay for it at least somewhat a little bit or something. Um, and you know, be able to, I'm glad this person's not in the mental health field anymore, but you could, I mean, it doesn't really help, I guess, to file a report now, but you could, um, just so if they decide to practice again, that that's there. Um, but yes, I would get another therapist and talk about it and process it because that is shit is not right. Um, and aside from even just walking in on them having sex, that's just not, nobody wants to do that. And almost everybody I feel like walks in on their parents at some point in their life and nobody wants to. Um, but the fact is your therapist so fucked up. Um, yeah. So I would, and then I think when it comes to, so get a therapist and talk about it. And the thing that I think I would have you do going forward is talking to, uh, at least to your mom about it and setting up some boundaries that feel okay for you. Like, Hey mom, will you let me know when he's coming over? Cause it's still uncomfortable because he was my therapist. So I prefer to not be at home or to be in my room or, you know, um, we can do our best to try to let people know what's okay and not okay. She could be a, a jerk and be like, you're overreacting and you gotta, you need to say hi to him. You need to be nice. He did so much for you. Blah, blah, blah. You can say, I hear you. And I understand. However, it still makes me uncomfortable. So just keep repeating the thing. Um, you know, so I'd like to be able to go to my room and not, not engage with this uh, creep. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I think talking about it and getting into therapy will be the best and they will believe you. Don't worry. They'll take you seriously. That person is a creep and that's not okay. And yeah, I mean, he could either be the boyfriend of your mom or your therapist and not both. Okay. I hope that like helps people kind of understand ethics and therapy. Because that is like legal, ethical, it's all kinds of bad. Okay, question number six. Good morning. It's actually good evening, but maybe when this goes live, it'll be good morning. How do you deal with people that are in therapy and have trust issues? Therefore, it's hard for me to open up to a therapist and afraid to talk about sensitive issues. Thanks from San Francisco. San Francisco. Um, this is very common. And Part of it is, I mean, and I saw in the comments, people mentioned this, and I think the person who asked this question said they're already doing this. But if you're, if you have a similar question and you're like, oh, hey, I want to know about this, you should talk about it in therapy about the fact that you have trust issues. But, excuse me, I burped. Um, I would talk about it just to figure out like where it's coming from, why it started. If you're not even able to discuss that in therapy, then that's some homework for you. So, if it's hard for you to open up in therapy itself because you have trust issues and you're like, hey, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what they are. It could be, I'm afraid they won't hold my confidence. Uh, I'm afraid of what they're going to think of me. I'm afraid um, that I'll be judged or I don't know. There could be all sorts of things. I want you to journal about it like, uh, and kind of let it play out, okay? So uh, one of the CBT tools and techniques I was, I've been refreshed because I'm working on it with a client uh I guess actually a few weeks ago now, but is letting things play out. It's a CBT technique of like, play it to the end. So in your journal, I'd like you to write, if I shared these sensitive issues, if you can write them out, that's even better, what those sensitive issues are. But if I shared these sensitive issues with my therapist, what would happen? Like answer that question. What am I afraid would happen? Okay, so if that happened, then what would, how would I feel? Okay, well, if I felt that way, then what? I want you to play this shit out. What's the worst case scenario? Then what's the best case scenario? And then I want you to come up with a more balanced middle ground, which is most likely to happen about how this would play out. Um, <clears throat> because when we have an issue where we feel like we can't get anything done in therapy, we can't uh, process, we can't talk, we can't, you know, you can just keep saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, it doesn't give a therapist anything to really work with, so they can't actually ask any questions. It's on us to go home and to think about why this is happening, to consider what we're really scared of, to play it out to the end. What would possibly, what's the worst thing that could happen? Because chances are what you're worried about is part of the real problem, meaning I'm afraid they're going to react like my mom always did, or I'm afraid that they're going to judge me like my last therapist did, or my dad did, or whatever. Um, 
And that tells us a lot of information. And that's actually the stuff that we need to share in therapy. So if you can, then you need to, once you've journaled about it, you're going to have to bring it up in therapy. Like, hey, I did some thinking. And I realized that the reason that I don't, that I struggle with trust issues is because my closest friend told, you know, told my mom everything I told them, or my mom read my diary, such an invasion of privacy when parents do that. I wish they would understand how horribly, horribly terrible that is to do. Don't do it. If you're a parent, don't do it. Um, It's just not good. So whatever it is, we need to figure it out. We need to bring it up in therapy. We need to talk about it. And that's how we'll move forward. I know that a lot of it's like, well, how do I open up? No, we need to figure out why this roadblock is here. We've run into this thing called, we're calling it trust issues. What the fuck is it? Where did it come from? How long has it been here? What are my facts that support this? Maybe I don't have facts. Maybe nothing's ever happened to me to uh, cause me to have trust issues. So then why am I putting this roadblock up myself? What is it protecting? Because roadblocks and trust issues, whatever you want to call them, these defense mechanisms keep us protected from some perceived threat or worry of what could happen. And so it's really important that we figure out where that's coming from. Um, And I know easier said than done, but hopefully that gives you like a place to start. We have to be a detective ourselves. We have to start journaling about it, thinking about it, checking the facts, playing it out to the end, using all the tools um, until we figure it out. Because it's very normal to to have trust issues, very normal to not want to open up to a therapist at the beginning, because it's a very weird thing to be like, I'm going to go tell a stranger all of my deepest, darkest secrets. It'll be totally comfortable. It's not, and it's not supposed to be. Um... But over time, it should get easier. But we still have to do our part as the patient. We have to do the deep digging. We have to figure out where it's coming from. You know, we have to question it. So give yourself the time and the ability to check in and figure out where this is coming from. Okay, cool. Question number seven. Hi, Katie. Sometimes I struggle with the end of therapy sessions because I have the feeling we've discovered a thousand more problems that I have to deal with during, but no solution. It's like unpacking after moving house, but without the tidying up part. Oh, I hate that. Do you have any ideas to better cope with feeling overwhelmed at the end of those therapy sessions? Talk to your therapist about it. I'm the same. I feel this way too. I think it's part of the fact that I'm like an organizational freakazoid and like can't handle a mess or chaos, um, which is part of the reason why Sean and I need to move out of this apartment. It's too small. And you guys, I'm sitting at my dinner table right now. So like shit is all over my house and I can't take it. But um, what I would talk about in therapy is how you feel this way. I would describe it exactly how you described it to me. That's perfect. It gives me a visual. I totally get what you're saying. And what I would encourage, I mean, as a therapist, this is what I would do. And you could mention this to your therapist so you can get maybe the ball rolling on some ideas of things you could do. But I have a lot of patients who don't like to come out of therapy feeling scattered overwhelmed. And so what I do is I usually end the session about 10, not the session itself, but like the tough unpacking part about 10, 15 minutes before we actually are out of time. And during those 10 to 15 minutes, I um, try to conclude what we talked about, like wrap it up, which I kind of see as like the tidying part, like, okay, so that was a lot today. So we got, I feel good because we got through, I try to like, you know, reframe it as a good thing. We got through a lot of stuff. You were able to talk about all of that stuff with your dad and your mom and the da, 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 whatever, right? Um, okay, for this week, here's what we want to, I want you to work on. And then I wrap it up with homework. So homework is kind of like, I feel like it's like putting those things in a box and then we seal the box up with tape and we're like, and when you come back next week, we'll go through that homework and then we'll figure that out. So then when we come back in, we open that box back up. Do you see what I mean? And so the homework could be, you know, uh, communication skills, putting up boundaries. Maybe we need to journal more. Maybe we need to have a gratitude journal. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know what you're working on, but any of those types of things would be that wrap up. And if you're listening to me right now and you're like, that's not really what I need, I'll still feel overwhelmed. I'll still feel un, like, I don't know, like everything's unpacked and not, not tidy. Um, then just bring it up in therapy and have them work on it with you because there's other things that we can do. I just don't know your specific situation. So it's a little difficult to like offer exactly what would happen. Um, But I think having that time at the end to kind of wrap things up, uh, do homework, uh, kind of come to a conclusion for that will help you feel more contained and less like scattered when you leave. Like I hate that feeling too. So that's what I would say. Bring it up. 
Um, and it's very normal to feel that way. Also, you guys know that I do this with most of my patients and almost always I leave at least, unless someone's like on a roll and we're having a tough time. Sorry, my nose is itching. Having a tough time wrapping it up. I try to give myself at least five minutes because it takes a minute to calm down. It takes a minute to talk about uh, the homework and what we've accomplished. And I want to make sure that we have that time. So um, yeah, bring it up. I'm sure they'll, you know, give you some more time towards the end of session, but you can off, you can say that too. Like, Hey, I'd like to have like 10 minutes at the end of session, uh, for a wrap up. And if you've mentioned that, then that gives a therapist. Cause I have a, a patient who does this for me. I've, uh, she's mentioned it. And so at the end I'll be like, I just want you to know that we're entering the wrap up time. So if we can, you know, and it kind of gives me language to help us get out of maybe a very deep conversation. Cause that's the thing is in a, as a therapist, you don't want to ever cut a patient off. I don't ever want to stop them from putting words to how they feel and, sh and sharing their experience. But if they really value that last 10 minutes, I want to make them aware of it. So they're not missing that time. Cause otherwise therapists will let you play it out all the way till the 50 minute mark. And they'd be like, okay, so we're out of time. And that's when you're left like, Oh, it could be like completely tearful. We need to pull it together. We have to go back to work maybe or whatever. So letting them have that time is really important. And yeah, we can bring that up as an option. Um, okay, so hopefully that gives you some insight into what your therapist might be thinking and also ways that you can feel less overwhelmed at the end of a session. Okay, question number eight. Hi, Katie. Am I a weirdo for still missing my old therapist after a year and a half? No, of course not. And how do I stop comparing my old, oh, my new one to my old one? I was with a therapist who I had the greatest bond ever with for about three years until she retired um, from it to become a business owner a year and a half ago. Oh, my therapist did the same. She retired. She gave me ample warning and helped me find a new therapist and even gave me her email to stay in contact with her. She's, uh, she set very clear boundaries though. Don't worry. I like my new therapist a lot, but I can't help but still have this really hard time not seeing my old one anymore. It feels wrong to still miss her this much a year and a half later. It feels like I'm grieving the person who died, but she's alive and well. And I feel like it's getting in the way of me better connecting with my uh, current therapist who I do really like, but I can't stop comparing them. I feel like such a weirdo. Thank you so much. Love your channel and the podcast. Aw, you're not a weirdo, not a, even in the slightest. I, um, uh, still miss my old therapist, Rebecca. But the, th the reason that it doesn't get in the way of me connecting with my new therapist, or I'm actually looking for a new therapist again, um, hoping someone will be taking new clients in COVID. That's a tricky thing, you guys. I feel you on that. Um, so I've been seeing my old one recently because I, a lot of people aren't taking new patients right now. And I'm like, well, I'll stick with the one that is good, but not great right now. I, I need a new one. Anyway, enough about me. So um, you have to bring this up with your current therapist. You have to talk it out. And I think part of it is get, allowing yourself or giving yourself the permission to grieve. It sounds like you're not, because just because she's alive and well doesn't mean we can't grieve it. We, we lost a relationship. We lost a connection, a relationship with someone that was very important to us and part of our growth and our development and all of that. And it's very, it's very hard and sad. I, I for me, Rebecca, my therapist, I saw through like pretty much all of my dad's sickness and like up to his death. And then they kind of forced her to retire around the time he passed away. And so she did phone sessions for free for like a few months until I got transferred to someone, like I found someone else I connected with. It was horrible timing, but I had to grieve that. I had to feel that. I had to miss her and be okay with it and cry and be sad and talk about it. And then also reflect on the work that we did do together, which is something that my new therapist had me do. It was like, I'd like you to start journaling about all the things you accomplished together and why you connected with her. And then I, if you feel comfortable, I'd like you to share that with me. And that really helped me uh, bridge that old relationship and connect it into the new one. And so I would encourage you to do that work um, and know that it's okay to grieve, even though she's still alive and well. Rebecca, as far as I know, is still alive and well too, but I miss her and it was a great relationship and I'm sad that it didn't get to continue. Um, so permission to grieve it, talk about it with your current therapist and, and journal about it. I mean, cause it's okay to compare them, but I think your lack of grieving and the, the, the feeling that you're weird, it's not okay. There's a lot of this like non, I don't know what you'd call it, but like the opposite of a permission. It's like, there's all these rules and regulations around you not 
missing her and not grieving it. And so we need, I need you to know that it's okay, that you're not weird. You can feel this way, you can grieve and you need to let yourself feel that so that it doesn't continue to get in the way of your new therapy. Um, all of us, we miss therapists. It's a, it's a weird relationship, you guys. And it, it deserves a, a, t a period of grief and grieving when we're finished with one, even if it's good. Sometimes like, um, you know, like I stopped seeing Jana, the therapist that I'm seeing now that I, I need a little more tough love than she's offering. Um, and I've talked to her about it and it's just not getting better. But anyway, she, I stopped seeing her for a little while and I missed her, which was weird. This is like back, um, probably like three or four years ago. And, you know, but I let myself feel that like, huh, I miss her. I wonder, is it because I need to see her or is it something else? You know, it's all helpful information. It's okay to feel that way. Therapy's interesting. It's weird. It's, it's different. Um, and we need to give ourselves the time to feel it all and talk about it all. And I'm glad you have another therapist that you do like. So let's utilize that relationship to process the old one. Um, yeah. And just know that it does get better. I know it seems like it won't. And you can still miss that old therapist because the connection was so great or, you know, and she, it's like your new therapist is never going to be your old therapist, but you can still benefit from your new therapist. And so anyway, it's okay to miss it. It's okay to... It's okay even to compare them, but you have to let your new therapist know about it and the things that you wish she would do. I think it's a she, it might be a he. And either way, the way things that you wish they would do um, so that you, you know, you're giving them an even playing field. Because if there's something that your old therapist did that your new therapist could offer, it'd be great to let them know, just saying. Okay, question number nine. Katie, can bulimia be only anxiety related? Interesting. Or is it then considered self-harm? I've been having binge purge episodes throughout this year, and I guess everything else would match up with bulimia, but I'm not concerned about my weight or calories at all. I've been struggling with depression and cutting in the past though. So it makes me wonder if this is just a subconscious way to still self-harm. Is this something to bring up with a doctor or should I focus on reducing the stress and anxiety? Love the podcast. Okay. Glad you like the podcast. Um, this is such an interest. I mean, I do live streams, but this is just such a different, a different way to talk to you guys. Okay. Um, eating disorders have all sorts of triggers and uh, reasons for their existence, I should say, uh, like the root of the root. Because if you do not know, eating disorders are coping skills for something else, just like your self harm. Um, eating disorders can, in a way, be another way that we self-injure because we're hurting ourselves, right? We can, um, excuse me, burped again. Um, we can binge and purge. We can overeat. We can undereat. We can overexercise. We can abuse laxatives and we can do all of that in the same, use it in the same way we use our self-injurious behaviors. I have many patients who self-injure and have eating disorders and those, they kind of teeter totter like, oh, the self-injury urges will go down. And what do you know? The eating disorder urges went up or vice versa. Um, so it's very normal for those to be like, what we call comorbid or happening at the same time. So just keep that in mind. Very normal. Um, still sounds like an eating disorder. Not all eating disorders have, uh, are concerned about weight and calories. Um, but it might not be bulimia. It might be like OSFED, which used to be EDNOS, otherwise specified feeding or eating disorder. Um, it might be that. And so that would be kind of my guess with it because it's, it, it, it is eating related. We are binging and purging and we're having episodes of that. And that is an eating disorder. Okay. Um, but like I said, eat, we can use self-injury and eating disorders for the same purpose. So the real reason that you might have these uh, unhealthy coping skills could be anxiety, could be stress. Um, I would definitely bring this up with a doctor and I would definitely get in to see a therapist because we have to figure out why these exist. It could be the anxiety and stress. It sounds like you've kind of like pinpoint, you're like, those are hap th those are things are happening um, to me and I feel that. Um, but I'm curious where that comes from. Is Have we always just felt anxious and we have panic attacks and things like that? Or is it trauma related? Or has our was someone in our family always telling us that we don't have a right to feel the way we feel? They could be really uh, putting us down. Could it have been abuse? Could it have been um, us feeling like everything's out of control. Like maybe we moved a lot as a kid. There's a shit ton of reasons that we could have an eating disorder or use um, self injurious behavior. We just have to figure out what it is and why. Um, 
So be a little curious, maybe journal about that some and reducing stress and anxiety is always a good thing, but please see a therapist, please start working on it and definitely, definitely bring it up with the doctor um, because we need to figure out what's happening and we need to let them know that you're binging and purging because the one thing that I worry about the most when we engage in that type of behavior are our electrolytes and our potassium levels. And I'm not a doctor, but I've worked with enough eating disorder patients over the years to know that 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 type of behavior can be really hard on our system and can lead to a heart attack. Um, if you don't, if you want to look it up, potassium and electrolytes really affect our heart and our muscles ability to contract in our hearts and muscle. So anyways, um, things that I would want them to check out. I want you to get blood work and get everything checked out, not to mention um, making sure that we're regularly seeing a dentist because um, binging and purging, if I'm assuming it's through um, actual vomiting and not through uh, laxative, that's a whole nother thing we need to get checked out, but um, it could affect our teeth and our dental hygiene, which can in turn affect other things. Um, yes, there's a lot to check out, but definitely bring it up. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's just quote unquote, just self-injury. It's still just as serious. It's still an eating disorder. And we need to figure out why these things exist. Um, and also just FYI, when you start seeing a therapist, I think uh, there's Calm Harm is a great app. Um, I used to love the Safe Alternatives app, but it's very expensive and I don't want people to spend that much money. It used to be like $3 and I guess they've increased it. Some wonderful people in our community let me know about that. So thank you. Um, but I do like recovery record for eating disorders. That's great. Um, and like I said, calm harm is great. And I'm trying to think if there's any others. I think that's really it. But anyway, if you have any great um, apps or resources for self-injury or eating disorder behaviors, let me know in those comments down below. Um, okay. Question number 10. Hi, Katie. How can I bring up something that a friend does that bothers me without hurting their feelings? I have a friend who, when he's going through something, he disappears. This is very common. We work together. And when he's having one of those moments, he avoids me. If I text him, he doesn't text back. He once told me that he acts this way because there are times when he just wants to be in his own head and not bothered by others, which is completely understandable. And I'm okay with that. When he comes out of these moments, though, he looks anxious and guilty when he approaches me. He has done this to his other friends before, and they've called him out on this in a very harsh way. So I know he's aware of what he does and that it's not a good thing. When I gave myself t time to think about this and then stop making excuses for his behavior, I was able to admit to myself that I hate that he does this. I'm not mad at him because he needs alone time or time away from me. What bothers me, and this is the key, is the part where he ignores me. I wish he would just say he needs some alone time or say no or not right now to whatever question I text him instead of ignoring me. Can you give me some pointers on how to bring this up to him and how to help him communicate his needs better during these times without things getting awkward? Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I have to say this because you said how to help him communicate. We can check in on people. We can offer advice when they ask for it, but we cannot make people do different things, okay? Just throwing that out there. But we can encourage the behavior and we can communicate our needs and our upsets in a very kind and gentle and compassionate way, okay? And that's what we're gonna do. Now, what I would encourage you to say to him when he's obviously not acting that way and he's back around and, and you've already kind of talked a little bit because he's gotten through that like guilty, weird, anxious phase. Say, I'm just going to say his name is Sam. I'm just making it up. I don't know what his name is, but whatever. Be like, hey, Sam, um, you know how much I value our friendship and I really care about you. And I know you've told me that you just like need some time away and you need space and you want to be in your own head. And so you just like go dark. You won't you ignore texts and you won't talk to me and you avoid me at work. I understand your need. However, I, I need you to understand my need. And all I need from you is for you to let me know that this is happening. So when you're going into one of these phases and you feel yourself pulling away, I need you to text me or tell me in person that you're going to need some space because I don't deserve to be ignored. No one does. And I believe I deserve a, a short explanation. So if, could you just let me know? That's really how we have to ask it. And I know you're thinking, Katie, that sounds really harsh. It's really not. If you notice, there's no blaming language. There's no, you always do this or you never do that. It's saying, hey, this is what I need from you because I am listening to you and allowing you to do this thing that you do without yelling. I haven't gotten angry. I understand. However, you need to understand that I'm a human too and you can't just disappear. I'm going to need a little warning. And if he's like, well, I don't really know when it's going to happen because some people can react poorly to, you know, to some kind of ask or boundary. You can be like, 
well, once you know it's happening, I at least just need you to send me if it's an emoji that we agree on or some kind of text. I'm going to need you to try to do that. And if he pushes back and pushes back, then you have to decide because we can't control other people. At this point, you have to decide whether or not you're okay with the relationship continuing as is, or if it's so hurtful and you hate it so much that it's just going to cause you more stress. And then maybe it's not worth it. And at that point, then you'd have to communicate that as well, where you can say, well, this, that's just what I'm going to need to continue, you know, being in your life. I, I need to know what's going on. It, it feels very hurtful for me for you just to not respond and to go dark and never reply until you come out of this. That, and that is a lot. That's like, first of all, you need to see a therapist and figure out why this is happening and what's going on. Um, Cause it sounds like he goes in these big depressive episodes that he probably needs to be treated for. Um, again, not your problem. He's responsible, but the least he can do is let you know versus just, I hate when people don't communicate and then just go dark. It's so rude. I, it drives me crazy. At least just say, Hey, um, I'm in it right now. I'll get back to you later. I don't care if it's something you copy and paste from his notes or if it's an emoji you agree upon. I think that might work too, like a black heart or something. I don't know. Jesus, whatever. Um, but yeah, I think that that is fair so that he can just say no or not right now. I think that that's fair too. Um, so figure out what you need from him. Obviously, I'm just assuming that that's what you need, but you can say like, hey, if you need some alone time, I at least need you just, just to say, I'm in it right now or something or no or whatever. Um, so figure out what your ask is and then ask it. And I know that you're, you know, we worry, oh, but what if I make it worse? What if I make them feel? We are not responsible for someone else. We are responsible for ourselves. And that's why we're doing this in a very non-blaming, non-judgmental, hey, I get it. I'm there for you. I just need this in return kind of way. Um, hopefully he'll hear you. Hopefully he'll understand. I would assume so since other people have been like not very nice about it, that if you're very, you know, you're just asking for this it's very, it's a very small thing, you guys. Um, don't feel guilty about asking for that. Hopefully he'll come around and do the thing that you're asking. Um, but if not, like I said, then you have to decide if you're willing to deal with that or not. Because um, that's just, it's hard. I get it. Okay, final question. Question number 11 it says, Hey, Katie, how can I stop judging myself for feeling the way that I do? It took me a long time to somehow see how or to somewhat see how I feel, but I still feel like I shouldn't feel the way I do. I get really frustrated that I can't feel the way I'm quote unquote supposed to and I fight myself all the time and it's really exhausting. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, you've got some negative thought cycles that are just fucking you up big time. We tend to judge ourselves when it, because it's like, sorry, you said shouldn't a lot. And I'm like, you, sh you're shooting all over it. Um, which I need to make a t-shirt of that. And someone made a design that I really love. Um, anyway, so the best way to, to stop doing this is to start noticing the thoughts that come up. Okay. So when you start to feel a certain way, what is it that goes through your head that makes you believe you shouldn't feel that way? What are the statements that you take in as facts? I'm curious about those because what we're going to have to do is we're going to take those repetitive statements. I'm sure they're very similar in nature and they, they're, they like spin and spin and spin and spin. I want you to write those ones down and then I want you to bridge statement them into more positive thoughts and also or, or like and or check your facts because I shouldn't feel this way. Okay, so let's say I feel really sad. And then I'm like, you don't have any right to feel sad, Katie. Other people in the world have it worse. How dare you feel that way? Blah, blah, blah. Whatever that nasty, stupid, you know, thought that goes through my head that doesn't help me at all. Okay, I'm going to check my facts. Well, wait. So I did have, you know, that really stressful time. And then I got in a fight with a friend or, you know, whatever's happened to cause me to feel sad. I have to validate that with some facts. And then if that doesn't work, okay, let's say I'm like, well, I don't have any facts. I just feel sad and I don't know why. Blah. Then I have to use bridge statements. So it's possible that maybe I have a right to feel sad just because I feel it. I'm open to thinking that maybe I can feel the way I feel and that, it, that just is what it is. Like there's no proper way to feel, maybe. And so we'll have to use those until we get over to a place where we're like, I'm okay for feeling this way because 
uh, the cutting off from feelings and the anxiety and depression symptoms that we all experience from time to time, I really truly believe come out of these negative thought cycles and these judgments that we place on ourselves when we have no facts. Thoughts are not facts. I don't know if you've heard this me say this before, but you need to hear it again. Thoughts are not facts. They're just thoughts. So let them come and go. Fuck that. We don't need to listen to that. Thoughts are just thoughts. We have like 60 to 90,000 of them each day. And over 90% of them are thoughts we've already had. Right? Mind blowing. Um, so know that, you know, you don't, your thoughts are not facts. You have every right to feel however you feel. And we just need to keep those nasty, negative, judgmental thoughts in check and uh, argue back against them. And if you feel free to argue, like if you don't need the bridge statements, if you're like, no, I can tell those thoughts where to go and where to stuff it, do that. Um, because the thing about it is once, you know, we're working really hard to, to somewhat see how you feel, but then you're judging it. So it's like you're doing all this work and then you're like trying to shut it down. It's uncomfortable. I'd encourage you also to like journal about what is uncomfortable about the feelings. Why is it that we want to shut down or why is it that we say that we should all over it? Um, what are feelings that are okay? I'm curious. That would be interesting too. What are feelings that you wouldn't be judgmental about? Hmm. Those seem to be only pleasant ones. What's so bad about unpleasant ones? Hmm. I, you know, I'm just, I'm very curious. Um, and that can give us some insight too and things that we can work on in therapy. Um, however, check those thoughts check your facts, get into those bridge statements or argue back against them um, because we all have a right to feel however we feel and we don't actually even need any reason for it. We can just feel it. Sometimes I just feel sad because life is hard. That's enough. Boom. I have a fact. I checked it. I have every right to feel that way. No judgments. Um, and yes, I know this is difficult and I'm talking about it like it's simple. I know it's not, but little by little, it will get easier thanks to a magic thing called neuroplasticity it means our brain can change. Um, anyways, I love you all. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful. Um, you have wonderful, wonderful questions. So thank you for sending those in. I made notes of that first one that I think I'm going to make into a full or the second question, actually, that I'll make into a, an entire video of its own. Um, so stay tuned for that on my ba my regular Katie Morton channel. Um, have a wonderful week and I will uh, see you next time. Bye. Why your feelings hurt. You can ask her why breakups suck or why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Katie.